And then there are a whole bunch of other, probably right now, I'm trying to think, probably, I mean, there are 10 or 12, we can see, say, yes, they increase your risk. Uh, they're relatively small increases beyond APO, lipoprotein E. Um, so the sum total is probably about 50% um, of individuals who have some kind of genetic risk factor. It's not deterministic. Then there are other risk factors, and they seem to be related to things that we could actually be modifiable. Okay, so for example, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cholesterol is a little bit up in the air, but um, those things seem to have a fairly substantial risk, and they're a little bit, you, you sort of think of apolipoprotein E is a big risk factor from the genetic side. These vascular risk factors are big from the modifiable side. Those are the, I think, when we talk about risk, those are the kind of things that we sort of say, okay, this is when we look at an individual. If you're thinking along the precision medicine line, vascular risk factors, apolipoprotein, are the kind of things one you can modify, the other you can. And there's some others that are, are clearly risk factors, but their relationship with dementia in general is a little bit tougher, um, and that is um, life history of depression, lower education, are two things that we really don't quite understand how they may influence the brain. It probably isn't through causing Alzheimer's disease, okay? And then there's a third category, which is other brain injuries. So if you have a stroke, and you, you're more likely to be susceptible to having Alzheimer's disease and becoming demented, okay? If you've had brain injury from tra trauma and you get Alzheimer's disease later in life, you're more likely to get a dementia syndrome. So anytime you combine brain injuries, you're much more likely to express a dementia syndrome, even though pathologically you, it, it may be due to Alzheimer's disease. The thing we think about in terms of CTE, what we don't quite understand, but I believe, is that what are the number of hits to the head is required? You know, we talk about uh, professional um, sports, particularly boxing and, and football, and we say, you know, these are high-risk things. Well, when you think about how many hits to the head these people have received, by the time they get to a professional level, it's not clear whether it was all of the stuff leading up to it and then a few more at the, higher, at the professional level, which of course is much more vigorous, or is it that the two are completely separable? And what I mean by that is, are there some kids who never get to the professional? You know, they, they played, they, they boxed as kids, or they, uh, they played, you know, uh, football um, in high school, or maybe even college, and then you wonder, did they get enough? And we don't understand it. We sort of extend that to, and I don't want to say, uh, less vigorous head injury sports like soccer and things like that. What is the necessary requirement? And as we begin to understand this better, we can understand the role that CTE plays. I will say, when you, uh, if you watch concussion or you, um, or you read the literature on people who have serious brain injuries leading to um, uh, behavioral and, and cognitive abnormalities, they are not of the same ilk as Alzheimer's disease. And the pathology is different, and that is, is that the pathology of CTE is primarily these neurofibrillary tangles. There is little or no amyloid. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have both, but I'm just saying there, there are sufficient data to say that you can have a chronic traumatic encephalopathy with no amyloid. This gets more complicated as we get older because maybe you have a little CTE and then maybe you have a little Alzheimer's disease and together that just, you know, you really are uh, in trouble. So I think we, we understand CTE a little bit, but there's a lot more to be investigated. You know, this idea is you are what you eat. And I think that there is clear evidence that certain dietary changes or certain diets lead to better overall brain health, okay? 
and it can, it can work through either because it reduces your risk for vascular disease, such as heart attacks and strokes, or because it does something else to the brain, okay? Um, so the thing that we tout a lot is the Mediterranean diet, okay? Um, which is f lots of fish, olive oil instead of canola oil or, um, or corn oil, and um, wine, okay? Those sort of kind of um, seem to make a difference. issue is, and this is something that we don't know, can you just add supplements like, so can I take my fish oil tablet and eat a steak and get to the same place as the Mediterranean diet? This is just my personal feeling. The answer is no. You have to change your metabolism and the way to change your metabolism is to give different fuels. You can't just add one fuel on top to another. Oil. A little a little uh, dab of, uh, uh, you know, uh, fish oil and, and with my steak isn't going to cut it, okay? So you really need to change the way you cook, put olive oil in the things that you make, you know, eat fish and take out other things. This whole issue about drinking wine, you know, should I drink wine, should it be red wine, should it be white wine, should it be purple wine? Uh, <coughs> Can it be hard liquor? Can it be beer? The evidence that I, I've seen, it suggests that it's probably the alcohol itself, although um, clearly there are additives in r wines, particularly red wines, that may also have their own action. So that's the way I think about it. But it's very clear, and this may work specifically through reducing cardiovascular risk to the audience, moderate amounts, usually with dinner, so a glass of wine with dinner is fine, you know, if you're drinking two bottles a day, you're probably not going to do much good for your brain.